Yesterday, I ended the class. We were discussing the question. I was discussing. You were listening. Uh, the question of population growth and why it is that generally the Jewish population grew more rapidly than the population, the non-Jewish population. And I mentioned the key factors, which I think are important, of child care. The ability to nurse children for a long time and the results of exposure to illness. Now, there was an additional factor, which I want to go into, but not in one minute, so I didn't do this yesterday. And that is, in general, the Jewish attitude towards marriage in traditional Jewish society. And in my very humble opinion, uh, there is a, an image and a stereotype and also a reality. And in this case, they were quite different. According to the data that we have, there was much more divorce among Jews than among non-Jews. Maybe 30, 40 percent of Jewish marriages in, let's say, 1850 ended in divorce. Is this good for fertility or not? Well, it depends on the social context. Uh, in, there was an additional phenomenon in Jewish society, and that was that there were many second marriages. If people had been married and their partner died or they divorced, very often Jews remarried, more than any other group. Uh, the Jewish, the theological view of Jews generally was that sexual activity is natural and it is best in the framework of marriage. So that it was not something that should be repressed, it was something that should be channeled. So that one finds very often Jewish men and women marrying two times, three times, four times. And basically, this is good for fertility, because what it means is you do not have people for a long period of time who are single. Interestingly, Jewish tradition was very positive on older people also remarrying. Even after they would not have children, it was considered to be better married than to be single. This is good for life expectancy because a single father or a single mother can very easily feel unnecessary and when they are married, it gives a structure and a framework. What does this say about the nature of Jewish marriage. Basically, it's a little bit of speculation. However, one can say, I think, two things about it. One is that generally marriages were satisfactory, reasonably happy. How do we know this? As you all know, as well as I do, marriage is not simple and not every marriage is happy. The question is, what happens when a marriage is not happy? What does it do to fertility? It goes lower. If people are not happy together, they will, they may, they will have babies, but not so many, and the child care will not be so good. If people are not happy, and they separate, and then they try to find a partner with whom they are happy, 
This is good for fertility. So that the pattern of Jewish marriage, early marriage, because the men were independent at a relatively early age, Re divorce and remarriage when the marriage was not happy, remarriage if the husband or wife died, this led to a maximization of fertility and to a, uh, and to a growing population. Now, for, as, and as I mentioned, for several centuries, the growing population found a solution by new areas of occupation and new areas of living. Constant migration from the 16th century within the region to new places that were formed or to new work serving as tax collectors so that a growing population could be dealt with. However, this could not last for, uh, this could not last forever. Uh, now, what was the, what happened when the population began to fill up and there was no longer an, an opportunity to find a place to live nearby. Here, there were various options. The, op the one option would have been to continue the pattern of migration from the west to the east. This was not possible because the Russian or the Tsarist government, when it absorbed Poland and Ukraine and Lithuania created uh, what's called, I checked in the Ukrainian dictionary, Smuga uh, Asidlosti, the area of settlement. I'm learning. And this meant the Jews could live in the territories that were absorbed, but not in the interior of Russia. And this meant that the most attractive area to live, and indeed was attractive in many ways, was to the south or to, uh, to, Ukraine, to the Ukraine. So that migration be, had to, once again to begin to be long distance and not simply within the region. So we have a pattern of marriage that leads to population growth, and, and this growth at times is not a problem, however, at times it is a problem. At the end of the 19th century, the, the general rate of population growth goes up. By then, Jews have realized that they are not able to support so many children, and by the end of the 19th century, the population growth of Jews declines and families become smaller. But we will get to that. Now, if we are considering migration, I do want to consider, just for the record, uh, a short-term migration which did not have a long-lasting impact. The, as you are well aware, the uh, uprising of Khmelnytsky or Khmelnytshina was a very violent uprising and led to uh, destruction of many Jewish communities. However, even destruction is relative. Destruction does not mean forever. In most of the cases, the destruction was very, very temporary, and it was not that different from the destruction of many villages which were occupied by Ukrainian residents and not by any Jews at all. 
the numbers that are often cited for the number of Jewish victims are very, very high. They're actually quite interesting. People throw numbers, 50,000, 100,000. Nobody tries to count how many, except for myself, of course, how many Jews lived in the Ukraine before the uprising. Now, at that time, the cities were not big. Cities were 10,000, 20,000. That was a very big city. There was no industry. There were no factories. There were the governmental bureaucracies were minimal. There was no need for big cities, and they did not exist. So that, in my account, the number of Jews who lived in the Ukrainian lands at, say, 1647, I don't think it could have been more than 40,000 in total. So if, that, if someone says that 100,000 Jews died, that meant that every Jew had to die at least two times. Now this is quite interesting phenomenon. And I do not think that this happened. I do not think that there was mass resurrection and then mass destruction again. Uh, moreover, one has to consider uh, something about the behavior of the Jews who lived in the region. The uprising itself was a surprise to the Poles. I'm not an expert, but it might have been a surprise, I think, to also Chmelnitsky. I don't know if it was planned five years in advance. But when there are surprises, people, of course, are not prepared. So that one has, uh, there were cases of fighting in which there were communities which were destroyed. However, after two or three, communi three communities are destroyed in the fighting, Jews and Poles and others, what would be the reasonable behavior for the other Jewish Jews in the region? What would have been the most foolish thing to do? To sit and wait. Mm -hmm. uh, the most intelligent thing to do would have been to flee. Was there a place to flee? When we consider the Nazis, which is something totally different, the fighting was so fast that no one could avoid, could run away. The evacuatia was a matter of days. There was nowhere to go. But in 1648, there was time and there was where to go. So, what most of the Jews, in my opinion, did is indeed flee, went as refugees to Poland or to Turkey or to Lithuania, which is further, but there were many connections between Ukraine and Lithuania. When they fled, what was left of the community? <coughs> Nothing. It was empty. If somebody saw the empty houses, what would they say? Well, it's very sad. All the Jews must have been killed. But they weren't killed. They were refugees somewhere else. How do we know this? <coughs> there is a curious phenomenon. And that is, shortly after the fighting was over, and when order was restored, we find active Jewish communities in the, uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, we also find, no less, a very quick revival of peasant life in the Ukraine. And this, to me, is one of the most amazing stories of the Ukraine, which I have not been able to read very much about. And that is, how were these farming communities able to reconstruct their society, their economy, so quickly. It was an amazing achievement. But people like to talk more about war 
then they like to talk about building. But building is an amazing achievement. So that the Jewish communities came back to, came back to Ukraine. How do we know that I am correct? No, you don't. But I think I am. <laughs> what is the evidence for it? The evidence is two, uh, I have two m m important elements. There are additional elements as well. One is, I mentioned the fact that there was a distinct dialect of Yiddish in Ukraine. If all of the Jews, or most of the Jews, had been killed in the uprising, and the new communities were built up, not of refugees who returned, but they were communities of newcomers, from Vilnius, from Warsaw, wherever. What would have they have spoken? Yiddish from their region. There would not have been the Ukrainian dialect of Yiddish. If the Ukrainian dialect of Yiddish existed, that means that people who had left returned. Where they returned to their property, to the communities they had lived in. What is interesting is we know that there were some communities where there were pogroms, and these communities were not rebuilt quickly. These communities were rebuilt later than the ones about which we know nothing, and apparently there was no pogrom. If Jews were coming from Poland, they would have gone everywhere, to a place where there was, to a place where there wasn't a pogrom. But if we see that those communities were rebuilt, were the majority, and the majority there was no pogrom, then it, that this evidence fits a picture of refugees leaving and returning. And as you recall, I said that in general, refugees who flee danger do not go far away. They say correctly, we lived as neighbors for many years, this will pass and we will be able to continue living in the same way. So that this is a migration which certainly existed, but it was a short-term migration. I think that most of the refugees came back simply because it was easier for them to make a living returning to their old homes than trying to find a way to integrate in Poland or or in, or in Lithuania. What I would just say before I continue to um, the topics of development in the 18th and 19th century is that we often do not consider the power of demographic growth. Many of the problems in the Middle East, which I know well from my neighbors, are are presented as political and religious, even though the engine which creates the problems is demographic. There is a huge birth rate in many countries, and when there are every year, uh, every, say every 25 years the population doubles, there is no way to provide education for all the children which means the children grow, grow up without education, which means that they are not able to integrate into modern economies. It's hopeless. It's necessary to limit population growth in order to create a healthy economy and a healthy society. But this is not dramatic. We read about bombs and we read about violence, but population growth is very much at the basis of many of these phenomena, so, for your thinking. Now, in the course of the 18th and 19th century, the Jewish population continued to maintain its position as traders, as craftsmen, which I mentioned, providers of services, wagon drivers, tax collectors. They were not farmers because they could not 
They were not allowed to settle on the land. And they did also did not work in factories for the simple reason that there were not very many factories. And if there are no fact, if there is no industry, then one cannot work in industry. However, in the course of the 19th and 20th, uh, the 18th and 19th centuries, there began to be major changes in the structure of, of uh, communities. And these are factors that I suspect you might know it better than I do. One of the most important is the, are the major <coughs> improvements in transport. Uh, as, uh, as I mentioned before, already from the 17th century, <coughs> there was a drop in export. The great export markets of uh, uh, Western Europe decl uh, declined with other with competition. Most of them economy began to be local. This began to change and we will see uh, interesting consequences. But export depends on transport, military strength depends on transport, and the key to developing a modern transportation system is what tool? The railroad. This was the most important improvement in the, as far as I understand, in the transport economy. Eastern Europe was not the first place to develop the railroad. It was developed in England, quickly adopted in Western Europe. However, the advantages of the rail were quickly realized and rail lines began to be constructed uh, everywhere. What was the impact of the rail construction for the Jewish community? They had an impact in a number of ways. First off, the railroads were a government monopoly or they were given as grants to rich individuals and it was a <coughs> an area in which there was a uh, offered many jobs and employment. However, just as Jews were not allowed to buy land and to be agriculturalists, with exceptions, but this was the standard, similarly Jews were not employed in the railroad system. This was part of a government policy and with some exceptions as well, they were not able to invest in the railroads. And most important, perhaps, they were not employed in the uh, factories in which the steel for the rails and the machines, the locomotives, the, tr the railroad cars were built. The, there were various reasons for this. The most obvious was that most of these, many of these factories were outside of the area of settlement. Uh, the, uh, I have to practice Smuga Sidlasti. It was outside of the region. Uh, there were additional factors as well. And this became part of the general phenomenon of industrialization that more and more factories began to be constructed, but Jews were generally not employed in factories. Sometimes the reason is uh, correctly given as bad relations, inter-ethnic relations between different national groups, but it is also interesting that sometimes when there were factories that were owned by Jews, the owners of the factories preferred not to hire Jews to be workers in the factory because it was first of all complicated by religion because in, according to Jewish tradition what day of the week is it forbidden to work? Saturday. 
and Christian tradition, Sunday. Now, there could be a very easy solution for this, and that would be to work five days a week. <laughs> no work on Saturday, no work on Sunday. Nobody thought of this. Of course, the owners of the factory wanted to make as big a profit as possible, they bought machinery, and they did not want machinery to sit for two days. So they closed only one day a week. And they said, if we have a factory with Jews and with non-Jews, if we close on Sunday, then we have to make the Jews work on Saturday. Many of them will not, and even if they will, if a Jew owned the factory, he felt bad. He was making a Jew work on Saturday. <laughs> Better to hire non-Jews. Secondly, the, uh, uh, the, there was the issue of sometimes poor relations between Jewish workers and non-Jewish workers. And thirdly, there was a general opinion that Jewish workers make trouble. Now, this is probably true, because Jewish workers came to factories with a tradition of living in cities. They had never lived in, as farmers on the land. Many had lived in villages, but with urban occupations. They always lived in a money economy, and they were always mobile. Now, Living in an urban environment, the Jewish, uh, the Jewish communities organized themselves independently, not from above, and they were organized in a religious point of view, in synagogues and small synagogues of various types, and there were many organizations that dealt with specific social needs. These were organizations to help the sick, to help travelers, to help people with educational problems. The Jewish pattern was, if there is a problem, to organize a group to deal with the problem. This is not something which is unique to Jews. This is not only similar to a bratstva, it is probably identical. However, since most Jews lived in towns and cities, they were very familiar with the structure. Whereas, as far as I know, populations that live in villages did not organize in a bratstva. That is just an urban phenomenon. So this idea of organizing to deal with the problem was second nature among Jews. If Jews would begin to work in a factory and very quickly they realized the working conditions were not bad, it was very natural for Jews to organize into what kind of an organization? A, what would be a workers union or what would be it? after time, a socialist movement, they would make trouble with the owner of the factory. They want better conditions, bigger breaks, more light, more air. And workers who came from a farm who were not used to working in a urban environment, it took them a while before they realized that they also could organize and demand better working conditions. So that in, this, in the industrialization that developed, as a whole, the Jews were not employed in factories. They earned their living providing services to the growing population of factory workers, but they were not factory workers themselves. In this way was very much as had been previously with regard to, uh, with regard to farming. Now, the increase in transport had an impact in many areas. For the small Jewish traders, 
What was the result? The result was more competition because people did not have to buy at a little store in the village or in the town. If they were near a train, they could go on a train to a bigger city and purchase there. Basically, this is very similar to a radical change in the economy of many countries today. What is the great enemy of a store today? Electronics, clothing, internet. Internet. More and more people buy on the internet. Yes. Buy. Purchase, uh, purchase on the internet, and if a person has an internet store, he can have it not in a city, it can even be outside of a city, where there are not very many taxes, where the land is cheap, he can work odd hours. However, what does this mean? That more and more people buy on the internet and not in stores, and this means that more and more stores around the world are closing. So that changes in the structure of distribution can have a great impact on uh, social, uh, on economic patterns. As we all know, going to the store is not only for purchasing something, it is also social. It's a place we see people, we meet, walk around and look at stores. This one does not have with an internet. And the question is, what will be the vo what will fill the void or the empty space? But we will be we have to focus more on the past and the empty space that existed in the past. This is discussed a bit by Scott Uri. I sent a chapter, I, don't, I assume you did not have time to read it yet, but he discusses the trauma of coming to the big city. And indeed, for anyone, Jewish or non-Jewish, coming to a big city is indeed very, uh, impressive and sometimes frightening and strange. Uh, if one goes to a big city where one speaks the language, it's manageable. But imagine going to a big city where nobody can understand the language that you speak. That can be indeed a very challenging situation. But the big, going to a big city changes the lives of people in many ways. And I want to discuss some of them because these are the byproducts of migration. One of the curious things that people do when they go on vacation, if they go to Turkey or to Greece or wherever people go on vacation, they behave in a different way than they do at home. First off, they do not have to go to work. But very often they wear different kinds of clothes and they do things which are sometimes, one can say, are a bit silly, if not worse than that. Now, why, are, why does this happen that people behave differently when they go away from their home on vacation. Why? Because their friends and neighbors and parents cannot see them. Nobody knows. Sometimes it can be a little embarrassing if somebody's at a club with a little behavior which is odd and in comes somebody who lives in your building and sees you there. What are you doing? That's not comfortable. What happens when people go on vacation? We all become anonymous. 
We don't have a name. We don't have an address. No one knows who we are. Going to a city, in many respects, is anonymous. How do religious factors operate in a small town? In a small town where everybody goes to church or everybody goes to synagogue on a regular basis, it's not comfortable to be different. If somebody does not go, then people begin to say, where were you? I didn't see you. Tell me, is something strange happening? But when one goes to the city, one can do whatever one wants. There are no neighbors who know you. Nobody will tell your uncle or your cousin. Going to the city gives the individual freedom. And this is freedom in many different areas. The price of this freedom is that somebody is alone. If one is in a big city and something happens to you, does anybody care? If you're lucky, yes. But very often, nobody cares. One can be all by yourself in a room and nobody will say, where were you? I have not seen you. Uh, when I was a student, I was in a dormitory at the beginning of the year, and a student died in the room. And it was several days before somebody knocked on the door, because nobody knew anybody, and you do not want to bother somebody, and he was all by himself. It was terrible, very stressful. But this is what happens when you are by yourself. It does not happen at home or in a home community. So that the city offers freedom at the price of anonymity. And the question is, how difficult is it to adjust and to deal with it? Now here, the, there was a certain advantage to the Jews who migrated to cities. Uh, Uri points out the importance of newspapers in cities. He is interested in the content of newspapers, the terrible stories that were told in the newspapers. I'm interested in the newspaper as a phenomenon. Now, there is a great deal of discussion about literacy as something that is important. And I think that literacy is important. That doesn't mean it is, but that means that's what I think. So if I ask you an examination, even if you do not think so, say that it is important. And on an examination, it is not good to be honest. It is good to say what the teacher says. So that, but literacy is widely regarded as important. Now, is literacy really important? If we talk about a pre-modern community, let's say 1700 in anywhere, let us say we went to a community, uh, to a village of farmers, and we invested a great deal of effort, and we made certain that everybody, men, women, and children, could read. Would that change anything? The answer is, in my opinion, no. Why? Ability to read is like learning a language. If we would have gone in 1700 and taught everybody in the village English, would that have changed anything? Also no. Literacy is only useful under one condition. What? when there is something to read. If there is something to read, newspapers, instructions for machinery, stories, sports magazines, if there is something to read, then literacy is important. By itself, it's not so important. 
Now, interestingly enough, in the Jewish community, there was a reasonably high level of literacy among men at all times. This was already in the early modern times. Why was this important? Because Jews had to learn how to say their prayers. The prayers were written in books and to say the prayer was necessary to read the prayer in the book. Not only that, there was a, an ideal of studying the holy books, not prayers, but holy texts, the Bible, commentaries, the Talmud. These were written texts and the uh, men or boys were taught how to read in order that they should have an opportunity at least to start to learn the holy books. In reality, most Jews that were not very successful in studying the holy books. Why? Because the holy books were written in what language? Hebrew, Hebrew or Aramaic or both. Aramaic is a language close to Hebrew. It's like Polish to Ukrainian. So the holy books were written in Hebrew and the people who studied spoke Yiddish and they didn't speak Hebrew. So it was very hard to learn these books and there were, not, there were no good commentaries or explanations for these books. Was this very bad? No. Why? If you don't learn the books, it's not a tragedy. Why? We do not need every person to be a rabbi. It's mm -hmm. enough if there are a few people who are rabbis. But if everybody would have learned the holy books, there would have been many rabbis <laughs> and no tailors. So we have a myth that education is good. And it is good. But if everybody gets a good education, then a society has a problem. It has to determine different groups will get different types of education. However, all Jewish men were exposed to, uh, exposed to reading and did achieve a minimal level of literacy. They were able to read something in Hebrew. Reading in Yiddish was much easier because Yiddish, it's like English and uh, Ukrainian. Which language is easier to read? No question, <laughs> Ukrainian. There is no language in the world with, with a system of writing as terrible as English. <laughs> English, it, it's, um, I, it's unbelievable. It takes a child in the United States several years to learn how to really read English. And they speak English. What do you say about French, though? French is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I'll but tell you why. teach a child French. <laughs> that, that, that is much easier. Why? If you take a, a letter C, in French, you can have the circum the circumflex, but here, just see. What is this in English? Who knows? It can be s, it can be t's, it can be k, it can be ch, all types, and it can be so many different meanings. Or g, How, why should g be sometimes f? But it is. If you write G-H, it's F. It, the, the reason is historic. Because they, they, in England, first they spoke a German language, the old English language, the Saxonic language. Then the French came, and the elite started speaking French. And then there were dialects. And then after they were speaking a whole mixture, 
they tried to write the language just in 26 letters. And the result is a nightmare, which is why there is no language so difficult to learn how to read with an alphabet as English. With French, each letter has more or less one meaning. There are a few ex there are a few exceptions. Do you speak French? Je peux pas un peu, mais pas bien. <laughs> I'm glad my French teacher did not hear that. She she would have had a heart attack. But when I was when I was 12 years old, I didn't know that French was important. Now it's too late. But the the English language is terrible. Ukrainian takes a long time to understand, but to read, you just learn the letters and you're there. I mean, Kirill and Methodi, they knew what they were doing. So the Hebrew is written without vowels, just the consonants. Now this makes Hebrew very, very difficult to read very well if, unless you understand it. So that it's a, it's a real problem. Yiddish has vowels and consonants. Yiddish is very easy. Once, if you know the Hebrew alphabet, you can read Yiddish in five minutes. So that the uh, men learned how to read Hebrew, and by reading Hebrew, they could also read Yiddish uh, by themselves. And the truth is that many women also could learn how to read Yiddish because all they had to do was to learn the alphabet. There were many books in Yiddish floating around and women opened the books and read them. So that one had a society in which there was a great familiarity with the alphabet, the ability to read, the only problem was there was not so much what to read. I mean, the prayer book, after a while, it gets very repetitive. But in the 19th century, something suddenly there were new things to read. Newspapers, novels, stories, literature. And the Jewish population very quickly was able to take advantage of these new opportunities. Novels and literature are interesting. That's not my field. But why would I be interested in newspapers? Because newspapers is another word for information. This is the key to many things. Through reading newspapers, the readers could learn about events in other places, opportunities in other places, and experiences of people in other places. Therefore, when somebody would read an article in the newspaper about how a bad person, <coughs> person took all of the money of a woman who came to the city, what were they really reading? They were I reading a what? Pardon? The city is not a safe to come? Well, they, read, they, they, they learned the city is not safe, but they also learned that it's exciting in the city. <laughs> but what they did learn is how to be careful. They learned not only the bad things that happen, but they also learned how to avoid things. So that one has the rise of a press and newspapers in the spoken language in uh, Yiddish, this had a great effect in encouraging people to explore new opportunities, much of which was migration. If any of you are studying Ukrainian history, the limits or the prohibition on newspapers in Ukrainian had a huge impact because this denied information to a population which would have been interested had such material been available. But when it is not available, they're not able 
to take advantages of opportunities as much as other people who have knowledge available. Information is a key factor. Now, in this process of the rise of cities, there was a uh, stream of migration very often to, from great distances to the large cities. And Uri points out that one of the uh, side effects of this migration to the large cities is, was the development of social problems which had not existed before in a, to a large degree. And he gives some f attention to the issue of prostitution among Jews. There were a, good, a fair number of Jewish prostitutes and also of Jewish pimps. Now, I assume they did not teach you the word pimp in high school. Uh, what would be the word in Ukrainian? Can you spell it, please? Oh, really? So this is a word, and, but afterwards I have to erase it. I'll explain <laughs> it to you. A prostitute is a woman who sells sexual opportunities for money. A pimp is the man who, who, supervises, who supervises the prostitute. Okay. That's, uh, like I said, that's not a word they teach you for the examinations in high school. <laughs> okay. What is very interesting is that not only Uri was interested in the phenomena, but there was a great deal of concern among the Jewish community at the time because it was regarded as a very sad and embarrassing phenomenon that there was so much Jewish involvement in prostitution. What is very interesting about it is that much attention was given to the fact that it was many Jewish girls became prostitutes. And the newspapers asked, how could it be that a Jewish girl would go into an occupation like this? Almost no attention was given to an even bigger question. How can a nice Jewish boy become a pimp? Or an even bigger question, how is it that Jewish men became customers of prostitutes? The only question that was asked was about the prostitutes. How could a girl become a prostitute? There was little question, how can a man become a customer? And this should be a reminder to us of the importance of considering gender in looking at history. Because very often the uh, questions that are raised are raised with some kind of gender discrimination. It's normal and natural for a man to become a pimp. It's not normal or natural for a woman to become a prostitute. I'm not sure what is normal or natural at all. But what is clear to me is if one looks at the phenomena, one should look at both sides of the phenomena and not just at one side. However, this was part of the uh, process of living in big cities and adjusting to life in big cities. It certainly was present, but the vast majority of people who moved to big cities were neither pimps nor prostitutes, but they were people who were trying uh, to uh, uh, maintain a good, to earn or find a way of getting a good living for themselves. The numbers of migrants among Jews was extremely high. Uh, in my, the article of mine I wrote about internal migration, which 
won a prize because it is one of the most boring articles there are, and it won the prize of the boring article of the year, it does present some, uh, that was a joke, it does present some data on migration to cities, and one can see that in many regions, the urban population, more than half of the urban population were migrants. What does this mean? It means that society was changing very quickly. That means that a very large percent of the Jewish population was not living in the place where they grew up. And since they were not living in the place where they grew up, they were much more open to new influences, to new values, to new ideas, and to the opportunities to move away from tradition. Small communities where many Jews had lived are very often traditional. News, uh, urban communities and urban frameworks are very often not traditional and offer opportunities for contacts with new ideas and, um, and with new neighbors. This was not the case, of course, for uh, every Jew. Some were in new cities and the stories about places like Odessa and about Kiev, there are legends about the nature of life in the city. However, there were, of course, still communities where there were very high populations of Jews, large percentage of the population, where in a certain degree tradition might have been maintained. One of the cities with a very high percentage of Jews was Birdichev. Why should Birdichev have so, such a high percentage of a Jewish population? At, at one time, I was, I was informed as I read, Birdichev was the Paris of the Ukraine. But this was a long time. Are you from Birdichev? Uh, no, I just visited this. Ah, this was hundreds of years ago when the grain trade was centered in Berdichev and the contracts were signed not in Kiev but in Berdichev. What happened to Berdichev? The city declined. It became not a major center but a secondary center. It could not compete with cities like Odessa or Kiev which were the new urban centers. So it had a large Jewish population. Why? Because it was not growing. It was staying the way it was. The new cities, which had basically many more Jews, were growing rapidly with many populations. And the bigger the city, generally, the lower the percentage of the Jewish population. The cities that grew attracted everybody. They had industry, they had trade, they had commerce, they had, they had transport. So some Jews were located in modernizing cities, uh, a growing number of Jews, and a minority, uh, not a minority, a large percentage, not a majority, but a large minority were located still at the end of the 19th century in, com uh, in communities that were, uh, that were stagnant and not growing simply because uh, there were no more opportunities. Another problem that was raised by Uri in discussing urban life is the problem of trust. How can you know who will help you and who will be honest and who will not? Here, there is no simple solution, but what happens generally when migrants go to another city or to another country? Who do they first seek out? People 
from the area or the country or the place where they came. It's much easier to learn one's way around a new location when you find somebody who speaks your language well. After you, a person adjusts, then one can master the language and then seek out new opportunities alone. But the, point, the importance of a network of contacts is extremely important in adjustment to a new city. How did this work in the context of Jewish urbanization? Their Jews had uh, factors which were in their favor and helped them. What was the main factor? Information. What kind of information could they have about a city where they were moving to, where they were going to live? What's Today, let's say you want to go to, you have a teacher who gives, says, here is a ticket to go to, uh, what would be a nice place to go to? Paris. That would be nice. Even in the rain, Paris is nice. If you would go to Paris, there would be a number of logical steps to take. One is to take a guide to Paris. Uh, another would be... Right, but you have a problem that you don't have very much money. If you have a lot of money, give it to me, I'll, I'll take care of it for you. <laughs> you, you, don't have, you don't have very much money, and this, you get a free ticket, but you don't have very much money for uh, a hotel. And what money you do have, you would rather buy tickets to the Louvre or to somewhere else and not spend the money on a hotel and just walk on the streets. Now, what would be the best idea to do? If you don't have a good idea, you don't get a ticket. Even if you do have a good idea, you don't. <laughs> the best idea would be to think do I know somebody in Paris? And if you know somebody in Paris, then you can write a letter and say, tell me, can I stay for a few days, or do you have a friend who has a room, and I would like just to, a very simple corner for myself, I don't need very much. All of this is the correct plan to do. So, before I came to Kiev, I wrote to all my friends. I had a place to stay, but I, can we go for coffee? Can we meet? Because I want to arrange it in advance. What does this depend on today? Email. What did it depend on in the past? Mail. Without the email. Some kind of contact. And what is the content of the contact information? Now, we see evidence for this, or a suggestion of evidence for this, in a curious phenomenon. Among the Jewish migrants that we see in the Ukraine, who came from other regions of the Tsarist Empire, what is the breakdown between male and female? Very similar. There are about as many women as men. If you remember Ravenstein's law, if you consider long distance migration, generally among long distance migrants, there are more men than women. And I think this is even true today in many societies. I don't know about Ukraine, but if we consider Israelis, people who go from Israel to America, it's more boys after the army than girls after the army. Girls go to Vietnam and come back. Boys go to America and work for a year or two. So long distance migration, the numbers tends to be more male. If we consider 
the pattern of long distance migration from Poland or Lithuania to Ukraine, this already raises a question, why are there so many women? We have to come to two conclusions, which will be useful tomorrow when I will discuss some of the aspects of migration to America. We have to consider two things. If we have a large number of women in, who, among the migrants, what does that tell us about the society? It tells us that they, we have here nuclear family migration. Either men and women migrating together as a couple, or men migrating and then after that bringing women or women following and forming couples or units in the place where they, uh, where they settled. Now, what, if we have migration of men and women to a long distance, and this is rather exceptional, we ask two things. What are the long-term plans of the men? What do they plan? To stay. To stay. They are going, they are going to stay in their new place. And that's why they bring their wives or their girlfriends with them. Generally, long-distance migrants, the, until recently, have gone with the idea to work for several years, to save money, and then to go home. And with the money that they were able to collect, then they will be able to earn a living and live a happy life. Much migration until now has been short term with the idea that it's to get the necessary skills. One sees this also with educational <coughs> migration. People who go to a big city to get an education, their idea is that they are going to the big city to get a degree, but that does not mean that they want to stay the rest of the life in the big city. After they get the degree, many people plan, at least, that they will go back to where they were studying. Certainly, if one sees the phenomenon of a postdoctorate, people who complete studies, and then go to a different country to study, they certainly plan to study in a different country for several years and then to return home. That does not mean that they will return home, but usually with students who study abroad, most students do return home because it is easier for them to become integrated where they grew up rather than in their new uh, temporary location. So if we see uh, a large numbers of couples living, in, migrants in Ukraine at the end of the 19th century, there it appears that they were behaving not in the typical way, that they were going to stay. Why would they stay in Ukraine? One main reason, because Ukraine was economic superior, it offered opportunities, and they did not anticipate that in Poland or Lithuania the opportunities would ever significantly improve. The future is in the South. So that uh, one, has this, uh, one has this phenomenon, and this depended again on information, whether it be through letters, and letters depend on literacy. So the fact that one has a popular Yiddish press, popular books in Yiddish, encouraged people to read and to write, and the product of that was more information, which was supported by, uh, supported by the newspapers, which encouraged people to take the big step 
of moving far away, but this was not a total gamble. It was not a casino. Uh, it was a logical decision because one person would write to somebody else who had already traveled, that person would describe the opportunities, and then one after another people would follow. In demography, this is called the snowball effect. If you take a small ball of snow and you roll it, it gets bigger and bigger as more snow attaches it. And, that, and it is the same phenomena, uh, the same phenomena that you have when, uh, when there is migration. What did this do to the topic which interested Roland? which he was interested in the population breakdown of Jews and non-Jews in general in Eastern Europe. And what he found, which was a surprise for him, I think, but would not be a surprise for us, is that the distribution of the general population to what percentage of the total population of Eastern Europe lived in one region or another was very similar between Jews and non-Jews. We, of course, can easily explain why this was the case. It had to be the case. Why? Because Jews were not involved in what field? Farming, but they were also not involved in industry. They did not work in factories. If you would have had factories where all the workers were Jewish, then you would have a huge concentration of Jews where those factories were. And this would be disproportionate. It would be more than the general population. But the Jews were not involved as factory workers. What were they involved in and what occupations? Services. They were providing services to the general population. This means that wherever the general population grew, that is the place where Jews would have the most opportunities. And where the general population was shrinking, that is the place where Jews would find fewer and fewer opportunities and where they would have to look to the option of migration. Now I'll come back to what I mentioned yesterday about the, uh, the, the expectations of Jewish families. Jewish families in many works of Jewish literature are described as very warm families, very close families. It sounds very good. But Jewish families grew up on a tradition that the next generation will have to migrate or will have to move to a new location. If one considers the uh, and the role of the grandmother in many societies. What does the grandmother, how does she spend her time? Very often the grandmother is described as helping her grandchildren. She lives near her daughter or near her son or in the same house. She remains part of the family unit and she is always there to help and comfort the grandchildren. Why is she so important? Because the mother has to do things outside of the house. Somebody has to be there. This phenomenon is much less common in Jewish society. Why? In Jewish society, the grandmother was encouraged to do what? To get married again. <laughs> and when the grandmother gets married again, she is not available to help all the time with the grandchildren. This, a, gra a, a grandmother who is by herself, it's a very sad phenomenon. Therefore, it's natural that a grandmother would be together with children and grandchildren. 
In a society which encourages remarriage, this makes migration much easier. A young couple can go from Lithuania to Ukraine to seek their good fortune, and they can hope or assume that older parents will not be totally by themselves, but they will find partners and they will find a way to maintain their previous lives. So that one has here a family structure which in reality is very, very flexible and not tight. There's a great deal of talk about love, about how happy we are to be together, but in reality, moving far away is something that is expected and natural. And this was behind much of the phenomena of migration. It was the natural response to the constant challenge of finding a way to earn a living. Tomorrow, I want to discuss the great migration of Jews to the United States. Uh, the material I gave you, I'm sorry, is very, very long. It's, I don't know any short articles. Whatever you can read, read what you can't, you can't, but I will try to present some of the main points, so this may help you if you want to go back in the reading. So, until tomorrow, please do not migrate tonight. Next <laughs> week, if you want to, next week, that's fine. But not tonight. I'll see you tomorrow.